Good morning. Um, let me very briefly introduce uh, uh, Kuhn Leenaerts, but not uh, uh, before thanking the whole steering committee of this conference, um, the uh, Institut de Hautes Études Européennes de l'ULB, um, the SEPS uh, Egmont, uh, and of course uh, ES itself, uh, um, and Louis Simon, who has been putting that so much work into the organization of this conference that I think was a, a, a really a success, a very big success. Uh, more than uh, 200 contributions were presented. Uh, we had uh, an excellent uh, uh, introducing uh, um, keynote speech by Gilles de Kerk over the uh, European coordinator of counterterrorism. Excellent, I have to say. And today we have even a better uh, closing keynote by the, uh, I hope so, I hope so, uh, by the uh, uh, President of the European Court of Justice. Now, the European Court of Justice is, I don't have to tell that to you, is a very, very important institution in the whole makeup of the uh, uh, European uh, Union. It's the Supreme Court of Europe. That's what it really is. It has more judges, 28, uh, which is better, I believe because the Supreme Court in US has only nine, and it's always a political battle to get the majority to uh, the conservatives of the more progressive ones. I mean, they are even now in a stalemate. So that's not uh, what is happening in uh, Europe. And Europe, by the way, is on, on many uh, issues better than the United States, but that's another discussion. Uh, uh, I have known uh, Kuhn Lenas for, uh, for a very long time, and we were even born in the same year, 54 which was a very bad wine year. <laughs> um, but in any case, all that wine is, is, uh, has already been drunk, so that's not the point. Uh, he is a uh, um, uh, very famous scholar, has uh, been a professor at the uh, University of Leuven uh, for, I don't know, 30 years or something like that, probably even a little bit more. He uh, is uh, um, first nominated a judge at the uh, uh, Court of First Instance of the European Communities uh, in, 19, uh, in 89, and he is a judge at the Court of Justice since the 7th of October 2003, and very recently, the 8th of October 2015, he has been elected as the uh, President of the Court of Justice by his peers, because that's the way it happens. You have to be elected by your peers, and everybody considers him to be the best. Um, I said that uh, the European Court of Justice is of the utmost importance, and I, I truly believe that for having been active in European politics and uh, um, also in the uh, academic world for, for many years, uh, the European Court of Justice has been uh, really very important in establishing the whole uh, statute, I would say, of the European Union. Uh, uh, they made a lot of uh, important steps and, and decisions with respect to the European Parliament, starting with the isoglucose decisions. Uh, they have been instrumental in starting the uh, internal market. I don't have to tell that to you. And again, I believe they are now in a very difficult and important phase of uh, the European Union, where they will have to uh, take a number of very important decisions. How, for example, do you uphold uh, uh, fundamental rights in, in a migrant uh, crisis. Uh, what uh, are you doing about uh, a lot of actions uh, that I personally admire, but that's something else, uh, of uh, uh, the European Commission on, on, on competition? I mean, how is all this going to happen? And so forth and so forth. It's, again, a very important phase, and I trust that uh, uh, the President will be uh, uh, speaking about all that. Before giving him the floor, uh, on a more personal note, he is a very persistent man. For example, he has six daughters. <laughs> I stopped after two sons. He's very persistent. And he has the extreme quality that the most important things and the most difficult things, very technical things, he can explain in very simple words, you know and nevertheless be technically sound. Because if you don't know something very, very well, then you try to be very technical, you know, and that must be very intelligent, that man. Uh, if, uh, 
that is something uh, very simple, then you can easily explain it in simple words as well. But if something is technically very, very complicated and has taken 60, 70 hours, I don't know uh, how many pages uh, uh, um, to explain it to the Court of Justice, and then you can explain that in very simple words to lay people, then you are really a very good uh, legal person. And that's what uh, Kuhn Leenaerts is, and I gladly give him the floor. Mr. President of the Institute of European Studies of the Vrije Universiteit Brussel, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the President for these very kind words, which I shall now try to live up to. <laughs> but let me first say it's a great honor for me to have the opportunity to address you today at the fifth edition of this prestigious European Union in International Affairs Conference. And as the topics of this conference uh, suggest, we live now in turbulent times. We live in a complex and fast-changing world, and the European Union faces a number of serious challenges at the present time. Terrorism, and I just got it that the keynote introductory speech was also devoted to that topic. Mass migration, mentioned by the President, and the ongoing fallout from the banking crisis, just to name a few of these challenges. These societal challenges, each of which potentially represents a threat to the project of the European Union as such, have all found their way into the docket of the Court of Justice. The cases concerned have raised novel and complex questions of law, giving rise to judgments that have often caught the attention not only of the legal community, but also of the media at large and of the general public. The purpose of my talk today is to highlight the need for the Court of Justice when addressing such challenges to strike a delicate balance between competing interests. And I will illustrate this first by reference to the fight against terrorism. And I'm sure I will put a slightly different emphasis from what I can gather than the introductory keynote speech. That's not abnormal. It's the difference between an administration competent for a specific policy and a judge having to judge on the legality of the same policies. The tragic attacks that took place in Paris and Brussels in the past few months remind us that terrorism poses a threat to our society to our security, but also to our society, to the values of our democratic societies and to the rights and freedoms of European citizens. One effective way of combating international terrorism is by starving it of financial resources. And in a world where capital flows freely between states, particularly between EU member states, it makes sense to pursue that objective at EU level. This can be achieved by freezing the funds and other assets of persons or entities suspected of involvement in activities linked to terrorism. Another way is by preventing such persons, be they citizens of the European Union or third country nationals, from entering the territory of the member states. Needless to say, Restrictive measures adopted by the European Union and those adopted by the member states when they implement European Union law must comply with the rule of law. This means first and foremost that when EU and national courts are reviewing the legality of such measures, they must remain committed to the protection of fundamental rights, notwithstanding 
public security considerations. They must strike the right balance between justice with a big J and security with a big S. Those are the two competing values among which, or between which, better, the court has to strike the appropriate balance, and this in line with the primary law of the Union. And we can observe that courts in Europe, North America, and Australia have all been confronted with the difficult problem of determining whether material on which, whether material on which public authorities seek to rely, but which they do not wish to disclose to the individual concerned, may be relied upon as supporting evidence. In this respect, I would like to draw your attention to the ruling of the Court of Justice in the ZZ case, decided in June 2013. And the facts, reduced to their core essence, are as follows. In the summer of 2005, Mr. ZZ, who is a French Algerian national, enjoying the right of permanent residence in the UK, so a French national, permanent resident in the UK, under EU law, left the UK to go to Algeria. Soon thereafter, the UK Secretary of State for Home Affairs decided to cancel the right of residence of Mr. ZZ in the UK, and they exclude him from the UK on public security grounds. Despite that decision, Mr. ZZ traveled back to the UK anyway, but upon arrival, a decision refusing him admission on grounds of public security was issued. He was straight sent back to Algeria. Mr. ZZ, represented through a lawyer, because he himself was ba back in Algeria, unsuccessfully challenged that decision before the Special Immigration Appeals Commission, SIAC. Now, this is a matter of EU law. I hope you all realize this, because it's a French national with the right of permanent residence in the UK, protected under the Directive 2004-38. That person goes to a third state, of which he also happens to be a national, but that's even immaterial in the case, comes back to the member state where he, in principle, enjoys the right of permanent residence, and that member state says, stop, you can't come in, public security. So he challenges that. The relevant tribunal, the Special Immigration Appeals Commission, in the jargon SIAC, delivered an open and a closed judgment. In the open judgment, that Commission, tribunal if you like, noted that, and I quote, for reasons which are explained only in the closed judgment, end of quote, the UK Secretary of State was right to refuse Mr. ZZ admission to the UK. Mr. ZZ was informed neither of the grounds on which the decision had been taken against him, nor of the evidence supporting those grounds. So Mr. ZZ brought an appeal before the UK Court of Appeal, which sits on appeal over the decisions of SIAC. And that court referred a preliminary question to our Court of Justice. Quite normally, because the procedural standards which need to be complied with is a matter of EU fundamental rights law. Because it's a substantive law right under EU law, the right of permanent residence in the UK, which is now being denied on very exceptional public security grounds. So the whole procedure and the proportionality of the measure and everything must be assessed against the standard of EU fundamental rights law. Mm. And in fact, the Court of Appeal asks whether a secret procedure of the sort just described is compatible with the EU law standards. The Court of Appeal in its reference, and I say this as a footnote, heavily suggests that it was not. You see also the independence of the UK judiciary. SAIEC is sort of a tribunal which is of an administrative type, 
But once you have a real court, the Court of Appeal, which is high, a high court, in, it's, over, it's higher than the high court, it's a very high judicial body, they take more independence and they say, is this compatible? The Court of Justice found that it was not compatible with EU fundamental rights. Our court struck the balance between justice and security in the following way. The court held that the person concerned must be informed in any event of the, I quote, essence of the grounds on which a decision refusing entry is based. Not all of the grounds in every last detail, but at least the overall gist of those grounds must be communicated. In the absence of such communication of the essence of the grounds, there is a breach of the person concerned's right to be heard and his or her right to judicial protection. Because those rights are ineffective if you don't know, even not in the very essence, in the very gist, what you have to defend against. Conversely, the court was far more prudent as far as the evidence is concerned. The evidence underlying the grounds on which a decision refusing entry is based may, when it is needed, remain confidential. But the court had added that the judge must take into account when using such evidence that the evidence has not been the object of adversarial proceedings and the contradiction principle so that, in other words, a judge normally when evidence is adduced by the administration, needs the contradiction to see what, in the end, the evidential value of the alleged evidence is. And lacking this contradiction, you must be very cautious to take the evidence as conclusive for uh, the facts it is purported to um, set out. So that was ZZ. But a further indirect effect of terrorism is increased surveillance. Executive authorities, both at EU and member state level, are keen to throw the net of surveillance as widely as possible in order to give themselves the best possible chance of identifying potential terrorists before they have the opportunity to bring their murderous plans to fruition. However, one of our shared European values is that in the absence of proper evidence giving rise to suspicions that someone has committed or will commit a crime, every person is free to go about his or her everyday business without let or hindrance, safe moreover in the knowledge that his or her private communications are just that, private. In the digital rights case, the court was called upon to arbitrate between those competing imperatives. As you will recall, the Data Retention Directive of 2006 required the member states to oblige telecom service providers to keep a record for at least six months of data relating to electronic communications traffic, in substance, who contacted whom, as well as data making it possible to determine the location from which communications were sent. The purpose in retaining the data was that it should be available, if required, for the purpose of investigating serious crimes, including, of course, terrorist activity. In substance, the Court of Justice ruled that the retention of information concerning the electronic communications of persons generally, that is regardless of whether they were suspected of any crime, was not proportionate to the objective pursued. Since the EU legislator, when adopting the directive, was under the obligation to limit any interference with the fundamental rights enshrined in Articles 7 and 8 of the Charter, those are the rights protecting privacy, the Articles better, protecting privacy and personal data. So the legislator had not limited to what was strictly necessary 
and did not lay down clear and precise rules governing the extent of the infer interference with privacy and personal data, such as rules on access, rules on the use of the data, etc. The Court of Justice thus found that the legislator had failed to meet those requirements and it therefore held the directive to be invalid. And as a matter of fact, we have now the follow-up cases, tele Sferige and Davies, because what happened when you quash a directive at European level, then the member states say, aha, that's interesting, shared competence, as long as the union has not exercised its competence, member states can go on exercising their own. That's the normal scheme of the definition, remember, of the shared competence at EU level. So member states started to re-adopt national legislation with similar content. Not all member states, because in a number of member states, their constitutional court had held in the same direction as our court, like Germany, it's well known. But not, for instance, the UK, not Sweden. So there they adopted laws with roughly the same content and the directive. Those laws got challenged in the courts of those member states. And what did they do? They referred the matter to us. Because electronic communications is regulated heavily, densely, by EU internal market directives. And therefore, all that member states adopt by way of legislation interfering with these electronic communications, which is cross-border services market, must, of course, comply with the EU fundamental rights standard. So now we have again in the Grand Chamber to decide whether all that was said in Digital Rights Ireland also applies to the member states as an EU law standard to be observed when they are implementing the directives on the electronic communications generally. In a world interconnected by technology, where one click may be enough for personal data to be transferred outside the European Union, the fundamental right to privacy must also have an external dimension. It's very appropriate to say that in a conference like this. So in order for that right to be effectively protect, uh, protected, the protection must not be limited to situations where the processing of personal data takes place within the EU, but must also apply to situations where these data is transferred to third countries. That is why the EU Data Protection Directive provides that national authorities, and as the case may be, the Commission, must assess whether the third country where personal data is to be transferred offers an adequate level of protection. In the seminal Schrems case, also known as the Facebook case, following revelations made by the whistleblower Edward Snowden concerning the surveillance practices of the US National Security Agency, the NSA, an EU citizen made a complaint to the Irish Data Protection Commissioner on the basis that Facebook's Irish subsidiary sent data, including his personal data, to the United States. When the complaint of Mr. Schrems, who, by the way, is a student, eh, like some in the room still, eh, I met him once in a conference. This is a young man of 26, 27 years of age, writing a doctorate at uh, one of the law faculties in Austria. It's an interesting person. Huh? But you see, you always need someone who triggers the litigation, which then brings this enormous legal issue before our court. <laughs> so when his complaint was rejected, Schrems took his case to the Irish High Court, calling into question the validity of the Commission's decision, finding that the United States ensured an adequate level of personal data protection, and thus challenging the safe harbor arrangements that had been agreed to allow the transfer of personal data between the European Union and the United States. You know how it works. The Commission, in fact, negotiates with the third country for the data protection rules in that country to verify whether they are adequate in the eyes of the Union. Not identical, but adequate, i.e. equivalent, whatever that may mean. The High Court referred the matter to the Court of, European Court of Justice, 
And our court held that the notion of adequate protection had to be interpreted as meaning equivalent protection, thereby ensuring that the transfer of personal data outside the EU does not undermine the level of protection provided for by the EU Data Protection Directive within the EU. Most significantly, since the safe harbor arrangements allowed for the NSA to have access, and I stress the point, on a generalized basis to the content of incoming electronic communications from across the Atlantic, that is from Europe, such access was found to constitute such a serious and intrusive breach of the fundamental right to privacy that it compromised the very essence of that right. And I stress this point because the non-lawyers in the room might maybe not understand right away why this is so important. When we say that the very essence of the fundamental right is being breached, the Wesensgehalt or the Kernbereich, as the Germans say, it's a theory developed in Germany, taken over uh, in Article 52, first paragraph of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, it means that the measure must be quashed. You don't even have to, uh, to go into a, a proportionality check, into the balancing. It can simply not stand because the essence of the right may never be breached. So here, the Commission decision saying that the safe harbor arrangements are adequate protection in the eyes of the EU Data Protection Directive, that decision was quashed and set aside without even balancing whatever balancing that could otherwise take place because the very essence of the right to privacy was um, at issue. To my knowledge, this is the first and the only case in slightly over 60 years of case law of the Court of Justice where the court holds that a union measure breaches the essence of a fundamental right protected in the Charter. All the other cases, including Digital Rights Island, was on the proportionality matter. Uh, it's not the essence, but you know, we have to balance it out and the balance was not appropriately struck. So it's a very important point. Hmm? Some in the intelligence community doubtless consider that those judgments are naive and legalistic. There are voices that argue that in the current climate, national security must take precedence over all other interests and that there is no scope for sentiment or scruples in this area of law. With respect, the court is not naive. We are painfully aware of the importance and difficulty of the choices that were asked to be made in such cases and the choices which we must make. But as judges obliged to apply the law and the court, the court came to the conclusion in digital rights that the law required it to hold that the rules at issue simply went too far. Likewise in Schrems, the court decided that as a matter of EU law, the very essence of the rights concerned had been breached. That a court is there to undo. The application of fundamental rights in the EU legal order itself is another issue that has given rise to a great deal of debate in academic circles in the past few years. Many commentators expressed disappointment when in late 2014, the court issued its opinion two of 2013, finding that the draft international agreement by which the European Union was to accede to the European Convention on Human Rights was, as it stood, incompatible with the EU treaties. A number of objections have been raised in respect of the court's ruling. But one of the central criticisms was that the Court of Justice seemed, in the view of some, to accord greater value to the principles of mutual trust and mutual recognition between member state courts and legal systems than it did to fundamental rights themselves as an expression of the core values common to those member states. I understand those concerns but do not agree 
with that reading of the court's opinion. And I would like to take this opportunity to briefly explain why. The Court of Justice rightly pointed out in opinion two of 2013 that the EU's legal structure is based, not least in the area of freedom, security and justice, on, I quote, the fundamental premise that each member state shares with all other member states a common set of values on which the EU is founded. And that this premise implies and justifies the existence of mutual trust between the member states, that those values will be recognized, and therefore that the law of the EU that implements them will be respected. Indeed, the principle of mutual trust is based on the premise that, and again I quote, each of those member states, safe in exceptional circumstances, those are key words overlooked by the critics of opinion two of 2013. So each of the member states, safe in, ex in exceptional circumstances, is to consider all other member states to be complying with EU law and particularly with the fundamental rights recognized by EU law. That premise is indeed an essential building block of the EU legal system and many of the key instruments establishing the area of freedom, security and justice, such as the various Brussels regulations providing for the free movement of judgments in civil and commercial matters, as well as the European arrest warrant, criminal justice cooperation, could simply not function in the absence of that premise. The premise is, however, only that, a premise, a premise. Mutual trust is not blind trust. Neither was the Court of Justice merely entering a formal and theoretical caveat in using the words safe in exceptional circumstances in opinion two of 2013 as should in fact already have been clear from the NS judgment of 2011, that is predating two years the opinion. In that NS case, which concerned the determination of the member state responsible under the Dublin regulation, the Court of Justice had already ruled that the member states, including the national courts, may not transfer an asylum seeker to the member state responsible where they cannot be unaware that systemic deficiencies in the asylum procedure and in the reception conditions of asylum seekers in that member state amount to substantial grounds for believing that the asylum seeker would face a real risk of being subjected to inhuman or degrading treatment within the meaning of Article 4 of the Charter. In the light of the continuing migration crisis, which has led to a huge increase in pressure on the whole Dublin system, one might regard that careful approach to the application of the Dublin relation, of the Dublin regulation, not only as sensible, but even as somewhat prescient. In any event, it is clear that as early as 2011, the Court of Justice did not regard mutual trust as an absolute principle under which all member states must be deemed to be compliant with their fundamental rights obligations, regardless of the reality on the ground. Any lingering doubts on that score may now be put to rest in light of the Court's recent judgment delivered on the 5th of April of this year in the Aranyosi and Caldararu cases. cases. Those proceedings <clears throat> raised the question whether a member state court, when called upon to execute a European arrest warrant, may or indeed must decline to execute that warrant in circumstances where there is solid evidence that detention conditions in the member state that issued such a warrant 
are incompatible with Article 4 of the Charter. That is that same article which was in issue in the NS case on the Dublin Regulation, the prohibition of inhuman and degrading uh, treatment. After stressing the importance of the prohibition set out in Article 4 of the Charter, a prohibition that allows no derogation, the Court of Justice held, expressly so, that the exceptional circumstances to which opinion 2 of 2013 refers may arise where there is a real risk of the person who is the subject of a European arrest warrant being exposed to inhuman or degrading treatment in the issuing member state. In order to determine the existence of such a risk, the executing member state court must follow a two-step analysis. First, it must rely on objective, reliable, specific, and properly up-to-date evidence showing failures in the prison system of the issuing member state that may constitute a breach of Article 4 of the Charter. Second, it must check whether there are substantial grounds to believe, in the light of the circumstances of the particular case at hand, that the individual concerned by the arrest warrant will be exposed to inhuman or degrading treatment if he were to be surrendered. This shows that mutual trust between member state legal systems is not blind trust, as I already said, and that the premise that all member states comply with their fundamental rights obligations under the EU Charter must in case of substantial doubts, be verified. Where such doubts arise, an executing member state court should make inquiries of the issuing member state court as to the adequacy of conditions of detention in that member state before executing a European arrest warrant. EU law indeed requires member state courts to undertake such inquiries and to provide one another with the necessary information in that respect. For as long as the issuing member state court remains unable to convince its counterpart in the executing member state that the execution of the European arrest warrant can take place in conditions that comply with Article 4 of the Charter, the surrender of the person concerned should be postponed. Postponing a European arrest warrant's execution in such circumstances guarantees compliance with the Charter, while it preserves at the same time the effectiveness of the system of mutual recognition set out in the framework decision, inasmuch as it places the burden firmly on the issuing member state to ensure that the conditions are met for its decision to be worthy of recognition in the other member states. So here you see very clearly, and I really stress this, the Aranyosi and Calderaru judgment place the burden of being worthy of mutual trust, mutual recognition on the member state of origin. That's the idea. If they have not taken care of their prison system properly, so as leading to situations which might be perceived as inhuman and degrading treatment, they are not worthy of the mutual trust of other member states. And so that is a responsabilization of the issuing member states to um, come to terms with their own, um, with their own um, homework, so to speak. In a different way, and lastly, the banking crisis, which has seemed at times to threaten the very existence of our common currency, the euro, has illustrated the need to uphold, in all circumstances, one of our most fundamental European values, that is the rule of law. The provisions of the EU treaties governing monetary union were adopted by the democratic representatives of the peoples of the various member states after careful consideration and the suggestion that the European Central Bank might act out of necessity in a crisis in a way that was contrary to provisions of the, of the treaties has given rise to grave and understandable concern in the member states, especially in Germany, 
where the perception was that in order to face the sovereign debt, debt crisis, the European Central Bank was arrogating to itself competences which it did not hold under the treaties, treaties which had been democratically accepted by the Bundestag and all the other parliaments in some member states, even through a referendum. And therefore, the German Constitutional Court, the very first time in its history, for the first time in its history, referred to our court, the Gauweiler case, that is a case which raised sensitive issues regarding the legality of measures adopted by the European Central Bank. And the court accepted that jurisdiction and found that the European Central Bank acted within the confines of its competence, but in Germany itself, they would say, it was a ja aber judgment. We validated the competence, but indicated on the way along to that outcome, the limits and the conditions under which that competence could be validated. So it's another example of how you have first a societal crisis, then you have political, administrative, institutional action, and then the court kicks in with um, legality control, interpretation, and in the end, enforcement. That's the normal mechanism in all these uh, novel uh, fields. As the cases that I have mentioned illustrate, many of the Court of Justice's rulings have political implications. But that does not mean that our court is an actor on the political stage, nor that those rulings may in any sense be regarded as political decisions. It is for the EU legislator to make political choices on behalf of the Union citizens. And in accordance with the separation of powers, our role is then to interpret and where necessary to verify the validity of the legal instruments that are adopted to implement those choices. Increasingly, EU instruments, normative instruments, have consequences for individual citizens in their private or professional lives, which inevitably brings fundamental rights into play. That is why, although the Court of Justice is emphatically not a human rights court as such, more and more of our judgments deal with issues pertaining to the interpretation and application of fundamental rights, primarily those that are enshrined in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. All the cases quoted, a few hundred cases already since the 1st of December uh, 2009, are all relying on the Charter. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, we live, as I said at the start, in an uncertain world. But I do hope that from the cases I have discussed with you today, there is at least one certainty in this uncertain world. And that can be deduced from all that I have explained to you, and from many other illustrations in the case law of our court. And that is the certainty that the Court of Justice is committed to protecting the values on which the European Union and the societies of its member states are founded. Values of freedom, democracy, rule of law, respect for fundamental rights. Values that form the very essence of the civilization that we have taken centuries to build. It is to the upholding of these values that the Court of Justice, as the judicial institution of the European Union, is committed, even in a context of terrorism, migration crisis, banking euro crisis, and other crises to come. The values, the principles, the law is constant for a union united in diversity. Thank you very much. Thank you.